you can think about the concept of preload as basically the amount of stretching experienced by ventricles during ventricular filling. So as the ventricles fill with blood, they stretch, and the amount of stretch that they experience, that is the preload. The bigger the preload, the greater the strength of contraction. Thank you, Erno and Otto, for helping us understand that. Preload, preload I like. Preload I can visualize. I can imagine that I'm loading up the heart before the contraction. Preloading, that's the pre before amount that I'm loading into the heart. That works for my brain. Afterload is a little weirder. Afterload is related to resistance. Afterload is the resistance that says during contraction or, yeah, during contraction. It says, nice try. You're not coming this way. Afterload is the resistance that, um, it's the force that resists blood flow. Resistance to blood flow during or after um, ventricular contraction, systole. So, okay, now think about that. It's not just any resistance. It's like the resistance that has to be overcome before blood will even move. So it's actually a, a specific quantity, and you can think of it as, dude, I, I, I want to push the blood out, like going through a door, oh, like double doors. Like, if you're going to go through a double door, you have to push through the door. You have to apply a force, and that's the afterload, the amount of force that you have to apply to actually get out. Once you get out, then you're out. Then you're good, and, and there's going to be resistance out there, but that's fine. It's the initial resistance that you have to overcome to even get out of the heart at all. Afterload is greater if the blood vessels are not elastic, and that's something that happens when um, when you get heart disease, when you get cardiovascular disease, arterial sclerosis is the hardening of the arteries and they become less elastic. They can't adjust to the changes in pressure. If you can't adjust, if you can't stretch, then you've created this, like the blood, the fluid has to flow through a set diameter no matter what, and that's going to be a harder task to push all that blood through there without being able to stretch and accommodate to that. Preload gets us ready to go. Afterload is what we have to overcome in order to get out. These concepts are clinically significant, and you're going to mess with them in the lab for today's activity. Okay, let's look at some other things more systemically that are going to affect resistance. So. We've spent all this time figuring out blood pressure mechanisms that really can change blood pressure. If you increase your heart rate, you can increase stroke volume and blood pressure. If you decrease heart rate, you can decrease your blood pressure. If you increase stroke volume, you can increase blood pressure. And all of this stuff, I mean, let's just draw it out. We have a, I can do this. We have little sensory receptors called baroreceptors. Baroreceptors. They're sensory stretch receptors found in your big blood vessels. And the baroreceptors receive information about stretch or pressure, and they send a message to the medulla. Who's this going to be? The medulla oblongata. The medulla oblongata is in your brain stem and is going to receive the message and go, oh, baroreceptors are stretching too much. Blood pressure must be too high. Send the message to, oh, where? What could we possibly do if blood pressure is too high? Let's go. We could change heart rate. 
heart rate. If you change heart rate, that substances that change heart rate are called chronotropic. Chronotropic. Where did that come from? What is that thing? Look, I can get rid of it. Chrono, except now I say chrono, chronotropic. How's that? Chronotropic substances change the heart rate as opposed to what's something else we could change. We could be an inotropic substance and change contractility or force of contraction. I like force better. So we can change the contraction force. Inotropic substances will do that. Or we can change the heart rate. Chronotropic substances will do that. Those are two options that we're like, we got this. We've, we've got all the pieces that will let us do that. Well, there's something else that we can do that doesn't have to do with the heart. And, and it has to do instead with um, the peripheral vasculature. We can change vessel diameter. And I want you to think about this for a second. If we're changing vessel diameter, the other words that we can use for this are vasoconstriction or vasodilation. And think it through. If we vasodilate, what's going to happen to blood pressure? If nothing else changes except we have vasodilation, do you agree that vasodilation is going to create a bigger lumen and that's going to decrease resistance, which is going to decrease blood pressure. If we vasoconstrict, nothing else changes, then we're going to increase resistance, which will increase blood pressure. By adjusting the diameter of blood vessels, we can also modify blood pressure and adjust as necessary. Now, um, oh gosh, what was I going to say? There was something awesome that I was going to tell you. Oh, what vessels can this happen in? You tell me what vessels can change diameter. Well, let's go back and look at our vessel chart again. And then, whoa, you tell me who could possibly change diameter. Well, we only have three people who can change diameter, who could possibly change diameter. The arteries could change diameter, the arterioles could change diameter, and the veins could change diameter. Only people who have smooth muscle can change their diameter because the smooth muscle, just like in digestive histology, we've got those rings of smooth muscle surrounding our digestive gut tube. It's the same thing with our blood vessels. We've got rings of smooth muscles. Do you think arteries are going to be the primary place where vasoconstriction is going to have or vasodilation is going to have an effect on blood pressure? No, it's actually the arterioles. This is where the majority of adjustment can take place. Arteries and veins are too big. I mean, awesome, you can totally vasoconstrict and vasodilate your arteries and your veins. But you're not, they're, like, they're huge. And where are you going to push the blood if you vasoconstrict and vasodilate those guys? You're going to push it back into the arterioles. If you vasoconstrict and vasodilate your arterioles, you really can generate a great deal of um, difference or change in where your blood is distributed, which will ultimately affect blood pressure which is kind of interesting. Okay, changing the diameter of your arteriole, there's a couple of things, a couple of ways that this happens. There is a whole mechanism by which your arterioles, the smooth muscle stretches, and stretch receptors in the smooth muscle itself automatically respond in a reflexive vasoconstriction. So when pressure gets really high, and does a big stretch, they vasoconstrict, and they're going to like, the, like shut down almost. Like no blood can come through now in this area. It's kind of an, an automatic self-regulation. 
They also will respond to different um, chemicals. So paracrine chemicals from neighboring cells that are doing various jobs. If they're producing a great deal of carbon dioxide, indicating a lot of metabolism, a lot of activity happening, then those arterioles may vasodilate to allow more blood in to get rid of the carbon dioxide and bring in more oxygen. Increased metabolism can be represented by or can be indicated by the amount of carbon dioxide in the blood. So you, you have all of these I'm pretty much going to stop here because the complexity of response possibilities with blood pressure, like how your body responds to changes in blood pressure outside of that homeostatic range is vast. And we're coming back to blood pressure because the kidneys play a huge role in blood pressure homeostasis, and we're not doing those guys until like way down the line. We're going to be peeing in cups and it'll be super fun. I mean, super fun. All right, the last thing I want to do is walk you through, I think I'm just going to use an old video for this piece. I'm going to walk you through um, how to take blood pressure clinically, and then we're calling it, we're calling it a day. That's all. Okay, bye. Let's connect what we're talking about in this lecture to the clinical concept of blood pressure. And many of you have taken blood pressures before. Blood pressure, we'll just, we'll just singularly talk about blood pressure. We're going to connect the clinical relevance of blood pressure, which is we measure systolic pressure over diastolic, right? Systolic. And you know, we expect 120 over 80 is our, what, average blood pressure, although there's a significant amount of debate about this and a lot of evidence that perhaps our average values should be lower, like your blood pressure should be lower than this. Um, pressure, blood pressure is measured in millimeters of mercury, and that's, we'll just accept that that's, those are the units that we often will deal with when we talk about blood pressure and lots of other pressures that we're going to deal with. Okay, so systolic pressure is an estimate of the amount of pressure in the aorta during what? ventricular systole. Remember, the aorta is the giant artery that's exiting the left ventricle of the heart and heading to the body. So it's a big artery, biggest artery in your body. And since it's so close to the left ventricle, which is the strongest chamber of your heart, it's going to be potentially experiencing a lot of pressure. Systolic pressure is the amount of pressure, the estimate of the amount of pressure in the aorta during ventricular systole when the ventricles are contracting. Diastolic pressure is the amount of pressure in the aorta during ventricular diastole. So you might be thinking, hopefully your brain is thinking, wait a minute, in the ventricle, during ventricular diastole, the pressure almost goes down to zero. But notice that in the aorta, the pressure isn't at zero. It's at 80. Why? It's because the aorta is super elastic. And when that huge push of pressure during ventricular systole pushes a giant blob of blood into the aorta, the aorta expands in an elastic manner. And the pressure upon the expansion is 120 millimeters of mercury. And then the heart relaxes. When the heart relaxes, it, the ventricles go to about zero pressure. But the aorta then goes back to its original diameter. 
so it elastically springs back to the original diameter, and that provides more pressure to push the blood down the line. So that's why your diastolic pressure doesn't drop down to zero. Let's talk about how you take someone's blood pressure. Blood pressure is measured. I'm leaving my, uh, whatever that is, web address up there so that you can see it. Um, blood pressure is taken with a Svigmo manometer. What? How awesome is that word? And you actually cut off blood flow through the brachial artery. So you'll notice here in the arm, you put the cuff around the arm, not the forearm, the arm, and then you pump up the pressure in this cuff, and you use your little column thing here to tell you how much pressure you have, but your goal is to cut off blood supply through the brachial artery. If you listen to the brachial artery, you can hear a pulse through that. Your goal is to eliminate the pulse, put the pressure up so high through the cuff that you cut off the blood supply. Now think about this for a second. How high is the pressure going to be if you cut off blood supply? It just has to be higher than the pressure of the heart pushing the blood out. Does that work for you? If the heart were pushing harder, if there was more pressure being applied to the blood by the heart, then you'd have to pump the cuff up even more to close off the blood vessel. Does that make sense? So now you pump up your cuff, you close off the blood vessel. Look. There it is. It's totally closed off. The brachial artery pinched off. Don't leave it like that. Then you slowly release the pressure. And your goal is to listen with your stethoscope for the first sounds you hear. Interestingly, the minute you hear sounds, that's because blood is coming back through. Now, the blood is actually turbulent which means it's like flowing, like the rapids in a river. And so you let the blood start to come through, and it's going to be all turbulent and crazy. And that turbulence is what you're hearing. They're called Karotkoff sounds. And that's what you hear. That the second you hear that sound, you look at the pressure, and you know that that's your systolic pressure. The heart is applying more pressure than what your cuff can prevent from coming through. The blood is coming through now. You mark that as systolic pressure. You keep listening. And when this Karotkoff sounds go away and you can't hear any more sounds, that's your diastolic pressure. That means that the artery is fully open and now the blood is just flowing through normally, and that's your estimation of diastolic pressure in the aorta during ventricular diastole. Did you follow that? Of course you did. I hope that in lab we take blood pressure. There's one concept dealing with blood pressure that's clinically significant, and that's mean arterial pressure, and I want to talk about that next.